Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic today is patient care. And so we've invited in uh, two people who have experience in this area. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, uh, Eva and Joe. And uh, Eva is a chaplain and Joe is a pastor, but he also is a recovered cancer patient. So he's been on, if you will, both ends of the spectrum. So I'll let you each introduce yourselves. Uh, we got ladies first in the South, okay. so mm-hmm. Eva, you're first. Oh, very good. My name is Eva Bleeker, and I am a chaplain right next door to the DTS campus at Baylor University Medical Center. And I work primarily with neurology and organ transplant patients. Oh, wow. That sounds pretty actually pretty fascinating. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah, that's great. And Joe? Joe Fournier. Uh, I'm executive director of Stronghold Ministry, which is a ministry to cancer patients. And uh, I was a pastor for 18 years, and I've been doing this ministry for the last five. I'm a graduate of Dallas Seminary. Um, if I have any bad theology, uh, it's not <laughs> Dr. Bach's fault. Just a little okay. disclaimer there. Right? So. Yeah. It's, it's a pleasure to have Joe in here. Th- there actually is a story behind how we put this panel together. Uh, Eva is the wife of, of Josh Bleeker, who, uh, who is the person who signs off on the admission of all students onto this campus. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Joe is a former student who I happened to see in a Jason's Deli while we were planning the uh, doing this topic months ago. And he told me his experience and what he was doing. And I said, man, you're a perfect fit. So I guess that's why I was supposed to have lunch at Jason's Deli, so we could meet. And then the really interesting thing is 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 that Joe and Eva know each other because of a past experience which I didn't know until just before we went to record today so mm-hmm. there's some there's some really cool what we call in my house coinky dinks yes. going yeah. on in, in this in this mm-hmm. podcast well Eva let's start with you okay. you're a chaplain and you've just come back from an interesting uh, program in Europe that yes. you uh, got a scholarship for why don't you tell us? Uh, how medical care is changing and that experience. Sure. So there's an there's an interesting thing that's bubbling under the surface of healthcare right now, and uh, chaplains are a part of it. Although it did not begin with us, uh, in the way that I'm aware of it, it's primarily through Columbia University in New York. It started with a doctor named Rita Sharon, and she has pioneered an area called narrative medicine mm-hmm. so you can you can feel that those two things normally are somewhat polar mm-hmm. in, at least in the academic community and um, dr. Sharon is trying to bring those things together with the recognition that a, a patient's story is a part of their healing process mm. and so the the training and the discipline that's coming up in this under this umbrella called narrative medicine is is pushing toward um, a kind of health care that recognize the, the human in the patient, the person who has a story to tell, who maybe can teach something to the clinician. Mm. And so the, the conference that I was a part of in June at King's College London was the first convening of the academic community around narrative medicine. So it was extremely diverse, people from the performing arts, from the humanities, writers, dancers, alongside the researchers, the linguists, and the medical community itself, the nurses and the physicians and the therapists. And somewhere I fit in there. Somewhere, um, as, a chaplain. <laughs> somewhere as a chaplain with a with a creative writing degree and, mm-hmm. and theological training from here and um, and then moving into daily patient care over at Baylor. Um, so I I talked about I got to present at the conference about work that I'm doing with chronic pain patients, particularly migraine headache patients. But the 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 big idea is that there's there's better healing for patients if we hear their their whole story than if 
we just bang through a specific list of diagnostic questions. And so that, that I think, is fairly plain in the medical side. I think that has implications, too, for how we provide spiritual care in a hospital setting that also hearing the story before we give our diagnostic questions is a good practice. So the, so the area, again, just because it's a brand new it's for It's brand me. new. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the area is called? Narrative medicine. Narrative medicine. Yes. And the goal is to hear the story of the patient and to, to really get acquainted with them from what I can tell and what they are going through. Is mm-hmm. that basically it as you're That's, caring for that, them? That, I think, is a foundation. It is. And, and – um, there are statements being made even such like this. It is important for the doctor to love the patient. Mm-hmm. And if you're like me, mm-hmm. despite the abundance of excellent doctors, you may have had a, an encounter with a clinician that wasn't particularly with a loving. who was a clinician. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, Joe, let's talk about your experience in t- on the two sides. So why don't we talk first about the medical condition that you had, and then talk about the ministry that came out of that experience. Okay. Um, and back in 2002, I had a lump show up underneath my arm mm-hmm. and uh, didn't know what it was. I went to the family doctor. Twice he said, I don't know what it is, but it's not cancer. It's too, it's way too soft to be cancer. Mm-hmm. So uh, I got misdiagnosed for about three months, mm-hmm. and it blew up under my arm, mm-hmm. and uh, it ended up uh, – I had to have a biopsy, and on Christmas Day of 2002, they said they called me and said, "What you have is metastatic melanoma." Hmm. That was the biopsy, and so they had to go in and take the rest of the tumor out because they only took a part of it. But it was it was huge under my arm because mm-hmm. I got misdiagnosed for so long, hmm. um, and then it spread to my stomach. I had a third of my stomach taken out, hmm. um, but you know those grow back. I found. You know, pretty pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I guess it that's kind good of, enough. <laughs> it kind of bounced back really well. Yeah. Um, but then um, it spread all over. It was in uh, it was in my lung, a kidney. It was in my um, my pelvis, and it grew through, fractured my ischium bones, one of the bones you sit on. It mm. was on both sides of my pancreas, mm. grown into the middle. One was a a large tumor, and. Uh, then in May of 2002 or 2003, I'm sorry, they gave me days to live. My mm. doctor said, "You know, you, you got days to live. You're going to die from this." Mm. And um, but the Lord turned it all around. Obviously, mm. uh, you know, here I am. And uh, that was like 10 years ago in August. Mm-hmm. I was declared cancer free. Mm. So um, I pretty much had it all. You know, I had all the chemos and had all the. I had three surgeries. I had. Uh, radiation, so I can relate to a lot of the things that people go through, and uh, this happened in year twelve of my pastorate. I, I pastored for eighteen years, mm-hmm. but in year twelve is when it happened, and we we started noticing all these people coming to the church who had cancer because mm-hmm. they'd find my story on our church website mm-hmm. and they'd say, "Hey, this pastor has cancer. Let's go. Let's go there." So mm-hmm. uh, it was turning into somewhat of a cancer ministry already and um you know and the people in our church kind of got behind me and said you know if you ever want to start a ministry and do this and take it you know take it off it will help you so that's what we did in 2008 Mm. on the day beer stearns went belly up Mm. is when (laughs) we actually (laughs) launched it which was a great time to start a nonprofit right at the beginning of the financial crisis right so but god's in control and uh call it we call it stronghold ministry because during it, it's not just – it's Old Testament God's stronghold um, as a support. He's, a, he's holding on to us because during it, I felt so weak and so powerless uh, so much of the time because it was a beatdown, you know. I come from Pittsburgh where, you know, everybody, you know, talks out of the side of their mouth and – You're a stealer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. You know, yeah. my dad was a drill sergeant. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I worked in construction all my life and in sports, and you know, being tough was it was about you know you be t- you, you're going to beat this type mm-hmm. thing, but it really beat me, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so, what I had trouble doing was hanging on to God, mm-hmm. and uh, but what He told me was, "Don't worry about that. I'm hanging on to you." Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where we got mm-hmm. stronghold, you know. So now our logo is kind of this, you know, mm-hmm. God holding on to to me, and. Uh, so that's what we do. We provide that type of support, spiritual support to people fighting cancer. That's our main thing. So how, how long were you in the hospital all told? Have you totaled up how long, how much time you spent in the hospital? Yeah, well, I, mm. there was, I had a couple times of two weeks in a row. 
um, probably, you know, I was probably in like two months, all told, uh-huh. you know. And uh, so, yeah. And you went through how many rounds of chemo? I went through um, 11 rounds of interleukin the first time, four rounds the second time. And it, and uh, they call them rounds, but they're like treatments. Right. And then I had uh, six rounds of, of a chemo cocktail okay. as well. Okay. Which chemo- was every day for a, a week. Okay. Six six weeks of that. Okay. Every day for a week. Oh wow. So, yeah. And six different at six different points every day for a week. Is that what the, how that works? Um, no, it's once a day, uh, five days a week uh-huh. for six weeks. Oh, four six weeks. Yeah. Okay. Six weeks in succession of chemo. Yeah. Oh wow. They'd give me a week off in between. <laughs> Take a sabbatical. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. So, wow. Well, that's that's quite a, and you and and. You were obviously on the edge. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, you know, it was in my pancreas. When your pancreas starts uh, closing off, mm-hmm. um, it it starts eating itself, mm-hmm. and it starts leaking, and it starts eating up all your organs. I mean, mm-hmm. it's designed to eat up things, mm-hmm. the enzymes in your pancreas. And so that's what it was doing, and it really hurt. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was tremendously painful. Mm-hmm. And they were giving me Dilaudid, which is one of the strongest pain medicine, even knows about that. And and I said to the nurse, I'm afraid of getting um, addicted to this. And mm-hmm. she said, oh, don't worry about that. The doctor said to keep you comfortable. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh. no, I knew I was bad, yeah. but I didn't know they had given up on me. Yeah. You know, And they started talking to hospice after that and all yeah. that. But um, and this is pretty interesting because I said to my doctor when he told me that you have days to live, Mister Fournier. Mm-hmm. I said, "Well, you know, I can outlive you." And he said, "Well, I, I, that's possible, but not very likely." Mm-hmm. And uh, and I said, "Well, you know, I'm going to be laying here on the bed. And you're going to you can go out and get hit by a truck in the parking lot." And he said, "Well, yeah, that's true." He says, "But you know what? With you Christians, I wouldn't be surprised." He said, "I've seen so many crazy things with you Christians." <laughs> And uh, he was a Jewish guy, hmm. Jewish doctor. Huh. And uh, he said, "You definitely guys, you guys definitely have something with Christ and Christianity. There's definitely something there." Wow, that's what he said. Hmm. And that was before I got better, uh-huh. you know. And he said I was the worst case he ever saw, and you know, hmm. so it was definitely a miracle. He calls it a miracle. My surgeon calls it a miracle, mm-hmm. and and we believe in miracles. Mm-hmm. You know, we believe that that people want that. To be the prayer, you know, they want you to pray for healing for them. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't believe God guarantees that to everybody in the mm-hmm. scriptures, um, and certainly not an experience, because um, we've certainly tried yes. to pray for everybody for healing. But um, we've seen we've seen some neat stories. We've mm-hmm. seen God answer some some prayers in big ways. Mm-hmm. And how how long has the ministry been going on? We're five years old. Five years old. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'll come back to you in a mm-hmm. minute and ask uh, what that all entails. So from a chaplain standpoint, mm-hmm. uh, uh, obviously you're dealing with people – if you're dealing with uh, neurological conditions and organ transplants, mm-hmm. you're dealing with people who are in pretty serious condition. By neurology, are we talking stroke patients primarily? It includes stroke, okay. but I see – Traumatic brain injury mm-hmm. and um, overdose patients. The the whole neurology unit is okay. uh, also epilepsy monitoring mm-hmm. and, like I mentioned, the inpatient migraine headache and and then a variety of other things now, on the neurology. This may or may not be a fair question, but I'll try it. Um, so, how does the if I can say this doctor nurse chaplain triangle mm. work for a patient in your view? As you think That's about that question. as a chaplain. <clears throat> Well, certainly the doctor is at the apex of that triangle, Mm -hmm. right? So they are um, giving the orders for Mm -hmm. the patient. And then uh, a lot of times I am working alongside the the nursing staff and also the the therapy staff. so I the the nurse is the is the gatekeeper mm-hmm. for the chaplain. I I want to be respectful of that nurse before I go in and see mm-hmm. anyone who's under his or her care mm-hmm. and um and then we collaborate afterwards. Mm-hmm. So an 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 exciting thing about my hospital context is that the chaplain is considered part of the interdisciplinary team. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of of voice, mm-hmm. our our feedback is taken seriously, and and one other thing I would say about the relationship when you set the patients aside mm-hmm. is um, a major portion of my responsibilities is to support the staff mm-hmm. on my floors. Mm-hmm. So here's here's a, an analogy. Okay. So uh, uh, we know that 
we have a core group of people in our churches who are doing most of the work, mm -hmm. but sometimes we focus on the on the visitors mm -hmm. who come in. Mm -hmm. And so we want to balance the care that's coming from anyone in the church toward your regular attenders mm -hmm. who are on their feet doing the, the heavy lifting right. and the people who may come into your presence and stay or may come in for a short time. And so the way to expand the metaphor to healthcare is that especially the nursing staff, although all, all of the medical workers who are on the, the floors, they are that core of people who are teaching the Sunday schools and working with the kids' ministry and mm -hmm. picking up the folding chairs and doing all of that hard stuff and aren't getting very many strokes for it. Mm -hmm. And the patients who come in, it is an honor to minister to them and to, to be with them, but if, if we focus on them to the exclusion of the nursing staff, mm -hmm. then we're out of whack. Mm -hmm. So I, to, the, to the extent that I can with the time that I have, it's my job to help support the medical staff on the floors. Okay. And, and then you mentioned a fourth player, which I didn't mention, but I just went through a friend having a stroke, so I'm mm. very familiar oh, with okay. this. Um, the people who do the therapy, who yes. actually, they aren't nurses, they aren't doctors, but they're also very important to what takes place with the patient, because they actually help the patient get ready, hopefully, eventually, to leave the hospital. Right. Yeah. So they're doing the swallowing and the speech and the walking and the standing, all of that rehabilitation on on yeah, and that that can be that can be very shocking for a person who's been self-sufficient, has a stroke, and all of a sudden they can't do anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so let's let's juxtapose the two things that we've talked to you about: uh, the the care of the team and the narrative medicine. How mm -hmm. does narrative medicine come in to this mix in terms of of patient care? Well, that's a good question. For for my part, it's just a natural mm -hmm. because the basic unit of chaplaincy is talking mm -hmm. and listening. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I'm doing my best work when the the style of attending that I'm giving to a patient is mostly listening. Mm -hmm. I, I may have I'm glad to see your head nodding on that <laughs> as someone who's been there because yeah. I, I think there's a misconception that chaplaincy is uh, about the chaplain talking mm -hmm. sometimes. But the Or it, the quick prayer. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I, I think the, the best attending is done by the chaplain mostly through hearing the patient's story mm -hmm. and kind of being receptive to the story even if it causes the listener pain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that is equal opportunity between the staff and the patients all all of us are there because something horrible is happening mm -hmm. it's happening to the patient and the patient's family right but we're, we all enter this narrative and mm -hmm. we are all sort of playing a role and so to to just offer a safe space for the story to be told can be relieving to the person who has to bear the story. And so um, the way that it comes into play is at every every turn in my day on the floor, whether I'm making a visit because something super critical end of life care is taking place or if I'm having the luxury of just making rounds, mm -hmm. Because my hospital is acute care from top to bottom, there is usually a, a need for a patient or a patient's family member to unburden themselves of, of that story. And that it was a surprise to me how effective and salient that kind of ministry is and, mm -hmm. and to believe that that is being Christian mm -hmm. to sit and just use my ears and to and to love actively love the person just by letting their pain into my body mm -hmm. um, but that's 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 kind of where the narrative part starts now I'm I have hopes mm -hmm. for for what I might get to offer that patient or I, I might know something that the patient doesn't know that I can give away mm -hmm. later on but um, so that that kind of attending is kind of like the working of a heart mm -hmm. so you have the systolic and the diastolic pressures going on and during that time of rest that diastolic pressure you're you're taking in 
whatever the patient has to give. Mm -hmm. And then there might be also a moment of systolic pressure where I have something to give back. Mm -hmm. And so that is encounter after encounter after encounter. And this involves not just the patient, but this can involve the family members as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And and um, certainly in in cases where um, I'm in ICUs and a patient is sedated or intubated like that, my primary ministry probably is to their family. Okay. Now, when, when Stronghold, uh, let's talk a little bit of how, how your ministry works. Um, uh, you are there to provide support for people in hospital. How do, how do you do the assignments and that kind of, how does this how does this work? Well, usually someone will refer uh, mm -hmm. someone to us, mm -hmm. and uh, the first thing we do, and I have it. Oh, he took it. Okay. Um, it's a gift basket. <laughs> okay. um, it's a tote, and uh, it has. We wrote four books, so uh -huh. we put those in there. And we also have a thirty dollars Subway gift card, which we put in there. And um, in a Bible, mm -hmm. and uh, these wristbands too, our stronghold wristbands says in a script on the inside. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but the whole the whole point is to build a bridge, mm -hmm. um, not only to the Christian ones, but the the ones who don't know Jesus yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big goal of ours is to reach people who don't know know Jesus because when you have cancer, it's kind of like God takes a plow and just runs it right down your heart mm -hmm. and opens you up and softens you up. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like low-hanging fruit, mm -hmm. you know. People are really want to hear what they I have to say. They do want to talk about life and death. Yes. Yeah. They do. I mean, and yeah. like in, when I was a pastor for 18 years, I mean, you know, you had different people who were more open than others. but. Yeah. These people, the ones who are open, they contact us. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's kind of really low hanging fruit be because of that. Um, and uh, so we send this to build a bridge, you know, the gift basket. And then people will email us and write us because we, we have uh, we have patients in all, almost all fifty states. There's like forty nine. Alaska's a hold out on us right now. <laughs> so um, if you know anybody in Alaska, let me know. Okay. <laughs> um, so and like 25 different countries too. So we send these gift baskets all over the world too. Mm. But um, we, uh, you know, some people will call. Some people I visit in Dallas area. Like there's like four or five. I got to go down to Baylor where Eva works, uh, and, and I got to go visit them next. You know, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go do that. So I do some visitation, um, but you know, the the bottom line is. One of the things, and this ties into what Eva was saying with the narrative, is is to kind of give people permission to be weak, mm -hmm. you know, because they they need that, especially with cancer. There's so much uh, of the live strong mentality, which you know, there's part of that is is really good, you know, mm -hmm. um, that you know, hey, you can beat this, you're going to beat this type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's people need to to fight with all they have. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, there's a there's a certain type of surrender to God in it mm -hmm. that you know you fight with His power, you fight with His strength, and not your own, and you um, you tie into Him and and uh, and you're also real with Him. Like if you look at Job, you know when he was that was a physical condition he had, you know it was boils all over his body and he was in intense pain, and uh, but he lamented to God, you know he let it out. And that's the part of his story there. Is, mm -hmm. And uh, same thing with David. You know, he's crying out to God and Jesus on the cross. And and I think sometimes in in a rush to be positive, or in a just a pressure to be positive, um, people circle around cancer patients or people who are really sick and, and try to. You got to be positive. Yeah. Let's be positive. Only say positive things. You know, and but it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And and I get a lot of patients writing me and saying. I don't feel very positive right now, mm -hmm. you know. And they can they say you understand me, mm -hmm. you know. You understand because the title of my um, my story on this is my stronghold: a pastor's battle with cancer and doubts, mm -hmm. you know. Because I had a lot of doubts too mm -hmm. um, about God, and you know, I had, you know, I had how many years of seminary training and all the you know all the thinking through all the hard issues, and I was a pastor for twelve years, telling everybody they could handle it, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, and then when it came to me, like like they said to Job, when it's hit you, it's it's a little different story, uh -huh. you know. And so um, when I was on my deathbed, I had a lot of doubts, you know. And so I can relate to that, and I and I let people give that permission to to be weak, you know, and then help them be strong in the Lord. So what happens is is someone contacts you, you send uh, this gift packet, mm -hmm. and then anything. What happens after that? 
Well, it, it varies. I mean, a lot. Some people just send a thank you note. Some people we never hear from them again. Uh-huh. We've sent out like thirteen hundred of them, mm-hmm. and uh, they were at eighty dollar value. We've we've dropped it down to fifty dollar value. Mm-hmm. But um, but you know, I think most people use that Subway gift card, even if they don't read the Bible. <laughs> you know, and we do that on purpose. You know, because we're trying to build a bridge with uh-huh. people who don't know the Lord too. Right. Right. And and what and so. Is there any kind of what, – what's the arrangement for any kind of personal follow-up or, or anything like that that comes off of this? Is that is that dependent on the local area, or how does that work? Yeah, it just depends on, on, that, on the person because mm-hmm. some, some of them will pursue us, and, and trust me, I have – you know, we're trying to find more people to help, you know, get back with the people. Yeah, that's actually you know? what I'm working towards. Yes, is, yes. Is, is do you hook up with – with churches to get people who are willing mm. to do the visitations in support of the ministry? How does mm. that work? Yeah, and we have we have there's cancer support groups that we help all over the country. Mm. Um, we're talking to two who are just starting this month. Mm. And uh, one we got an email from a guy today who wants to start a cancer support group at his mm. church. So we support supporters. Okay. You know. And uh, we also support nurse navigators, and uh, we support um, doctors who want to give out our books and stuff. And uh, but we also I send out a blog too, a newsletter, mm-hmm. and that keeps people tied into us, you know, because they'll, they'll get a new a new um, email and and you know with a, a devotional, and um, that helps them connect back to us. And they'll write us, ask for prayer. Um, we follow people on Caring Bridge. We have some staff, you know, um, who who go visit people. Um, my wife's involved. She's part time with the ministry. She does support groups. We also have a prayer group in town, um, a once a month prayer group, and uh, so we've had support groups that we're ongoing to off and on. And so we do a lot of a variety of different things. Okay, well, I'm going to come back to this because this because this is important to mm-hmm. encourage churches to think about how they can minister to people in their communities mm-hmm. who are who find themselves in the situation. And usually that burden is left mostly to the pastor and to the pastoral staff. Mm-hmm. And so um, uh, what you're doing is is significant in that regard. Let me come back to the chaplaincy here and say. Um, you, you've talked about the importance of listening, that kind of thing. What do you? What do you? Obviously, you listen just to listen. I mean, just to hear the story. But I, I've got to ask this question: What do you listen for? In other words, um, mm. beyond beyond hearing the story, uh, what what do you hope you might hear, and what might be what might be a door? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I think broadly, I'm listening for the meaning that the patient is putting behind the story. What kind of theological meaning or lack of uh, of a theological construct might be there? Um, so, even for one in one person's journey, journey they can feel the weight of their suffering in different ways and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and think of it in different things, thinking of it as a test, thinking of it as a punishment, finding it to be meaningless, um, to say nothing of the isolation or the brokenness or the disability that might be associated with it, like Joe was saying. um, When a person who has been healthy and strong experiences disability for the first time, it usually creates a shift in identity. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening for all of that. um, And and then more specifically, sometimes bec- because of my role with the hospital, I'm, look- I'm listening for even things like, is, might this patient harm themselves? Mm-hmm. So we, we screen for suicidality and things mm-hmm. like that too. Mm. Like I said, we, we only take acute care patients. So these, these are people whose illness is driving the bus right mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. So, um, and you know, I think that just about anything is a door mm-hmm. for I, for so many people. Just receiving the kindness of of a respectful ear mm-hmm. is a door. Mm-hmm. That, like Joe was lifting up for patients who cannot be real with the the people who are closest with them. That mm-hmm. they can't. Maybe they are blocked somehow within their social group or their family unit to talking about the potential of their death. Mm-hmm. To to have someone who is is willing to listen to the fear or 
willing to pray that they would live is a door. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's 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 just present in the room at all times. Now, for for, for me, you know, my patient population is extremely diverse. I mm-hmm. had no idea just how how um, diverse our community here in Dallas Fort Worth is until I started seeing who's at the hospital. Mm-hmm. So I'm I am in very close proximity with people from all over the world Mm -hmm. and they are every single one of them is suffering in some way and so it's just not hard to get into a spiritual conversation when those are the elements that have brought us together join us next week for part two of the table podcast dallas theological seminary teach truth love well